Ask my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior. Drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The ancient seal by heavy stone, Messiah still and all Good morning and welcome to Palm Sunday. Worship with here, here with us on Facebook and YouTube Live at Tays Valley Church of God. We are thrilled to have you joining us. We encourage you to take a moment and comment where you're watching from and chat with one another throughout the service. 
It's our desire that you're going to experience the Lord's presence wherever you are. Uh, we encourage you to share this service on your Facebook page and to participate fully in each aspect of the service. That means you can stand or sit. You can sing along. You can send in a prayer request. You can pray for one another. You can even send in your offering and even say amen or hallelujah in the chat feature. Today, we're a little while later, we're going to be taking our communion, and we encourage you to find whatever elements you have that would represent the body and blood of Christ so you can join with us in that as well. Thanks for worshiping with us today. Now join us as we kick off this worship of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. It's good to gather in the name of the Lord. Hosanna. Blessed be the name of the Lord. This is Palm Sunday, a day that we celebrate Jesus' triumphal entry as he entered into Jerusalem on a donkey in the fulfillment of Scripture. Yet another promise we see Jesus fulfilling the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, is hailed as such by the people in Jerusalem. I'm going to read a few verses from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 21, and then I'm going to invite you to read along with me. Hear the word of the Lord, beginning in verse 6. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and laid their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowd that went ahead of him and those that followed kept shouting, read this with me, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Praise the Lord. Let's get our praise on this morning. We bless your name.
It's a change for our lives. It's a, a builder of our faith. The name of Jesus is healing. We know the mention of the name of Jesus causes demons to tremble. And so we just press in today to lift up the name of Jesus. Just go ahead and say that wherever you are, Jesus. Jesus, sweetest name I know. There's something about the name of Jesus. Amen. Oh, wow. We know that when we go to the Lord in prayer, we have the full attention of heaven. And so we want to believe God for miracles, signs, and wonders. If there was ever a time we needed them, it's now. I want to share with you the names of persons who have lost loved ones this week and ask that you be lifting them up. Not just lifting them up in the moment, but maybe go ahead and take a pen, pencil, get your phone out, put it in your notes. Remember these people before the Lord. Let them know that you are lifting them to Jesus. It means so much, your support, your care. We want to lift up DeWitt and Beverly Miller and their family on the passing of their daughter, Mary, this week. John and Lisa Sargent and their children and extended family on the passing of John's father. This man would have also been the brother to Joyce Pfizer, so the Pfizer and Williams families need our prayers as well. Megan Lawrence said goodbye to her grandfather this week as he went to be with the Lord. And Sister Brenda Craft has had a cousin pass, and the next day has had her mother pass. Please lift her and her family, all of the extended family in these situations. You know, this is really an especially hard time for the people who are grieving without that embrace, grieving without that handshake, grieving without seeing those people that they haven't seen for a long time to reminisce, to share those stories with. And it's also a very difficult time for people in the hospital without loved ones to be there to comfort and to listen to those instructions that are given by the physicians. And let's think about those people whose treatments have been suspended during this time. They can't have the tests done that they need to have done. They cannot um, have procedures done that they need to have done. You know, there are, are diagnostic things that need to be happening so that people know why those aches and pains are alerting them that something is wrong. And so we just need God to, to make a way. We need God, we need you to make a way. We need you to make a way. So grateful that Rick Melvin is home from the hospital. Pray, pray for his complete recovery. Pastor Jed was to have been in our service today, but he has had another gallbladder attack. Surgery was supposed to be later this month, but I think they're going to look for a way to help him sooner. So please lift him up. My mom's got to have another blood transfusion on Monday. And Sherry Tedro's niece, her husband, Brandon, and Linda Beckwith, a friend of this congregation, are fighting for their lives with this coronavirus. Just lift all of these right now as Pastor David comes to lead us. I am so glad today that Jesus rode into Jerusalem that Palm Sunday. And Jesus wants to ride into Jerusalem of your heart today. He wants to take away that fear, that pain, and whatever it is. And you've heard these prayer needs. So we don't pray for to a God who is far off, he's here in all of his holy 
overflowing glory. Jesus Christ is here. He's alive and well, and he wants to touch you. He wants to touch this world, and we're going to pray to him now. We're going to believe that. Lord Jesus, thank you for such a day and time because all that's happening right now, the world has never seen this kind of situation with this coronavirus, and people are just absolutely filled with fear. And we just pray, Lord, we know that to have fear is natural, but when fear has us, there's something wrong there. We ask you to take those fears. We ask you to bring that peace, that peace that passes understanding, that peace that you said you give to us, not like the world gives. Everything around us might not be well, but we can be well. We pray, Lord Jesus, for your healing touch to everyone who was mentioned, even those that you might be thinking about right now, Lord, and those who are watching online, we pray for their needs, especially those who are lost, those who are unsaved, need to come to you because you have come a long way to all of us. Lord Jesus, we thank you. We believe in you. We're going to trust you and do, Lord, what you do best. In your name we pray, amen. Amen, amen. We continue to worship. We raise a hallelujah. Go ahead and clap at home.
The story of the Last Supper can be found in all four Gospels, but today I would like to share with you Matthew's account of this event. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and we, when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat. This is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, and I will not drink from this fruit of the vine, from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. This was literally Jesus' last meal with his disciples. And even in his final moments, he was teaching them how to be followers. Jesus was trying to prepare his friends for the storm ahead. And they didn't even realize it. I think many times God is preparing us for what may lay ahead in our lives. But we don't even recognize it until we're in the midst of it. Today, as we take an opportunity to take communion together, I ask you to reflect on what God has trying to be trying to teach you during this season. Maybe it is you need to trust him more, not sweat the small stuff, or to slow down and enjoy the quiet. Before we partake in the elements, will you all please join me in the Lord's Prayer together? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us take of our elements. Lord, teach us to follow. Teach us to be good followers during this time. Ooh, it's tough. We have so many needs, so many worries. I think our eyes have been on the problem and maybe not on following Jesus. So we're just saying, Lord, through this song, help us to release everything to you that would keep us from following. Help us to release everything that would keep us from hearing. We're desperate to be with you today. In desperate need of the mercy at the end of my own strength I fall upon the kindness of your grace. 
call upon the name of the Lord in times like this and every day to save us and to provide for us and to care for us and he's never let us down yet and we give him praise for that. Church, I want to thank you for your faithfulness in sending in your tithes and your offerings so that the ministries of Taze Valley Church of God can continue in these uncertain times. If you'd like to give today, you can do so in a few different ways. First of all, you can visit tvcog.org and click on the Give Now button. You can use our text to give option, which is texting your offering amount to 84321. And you can mail your offering to TVCOG, P.O. Box 270, Scott Depot, West Virginia, 25560. It really is a blessing to see the church being faithful in difficult times. It allows us to continue to minister to the growing number of needs around our community as so many folks are struggling right now. We thank you for your faithfulness. And I invite you to pray with me now as we take up our offering. Father God, we thank you so much for the opportunity just to to worship you, to be a part of a church that loves you and wants to serve you and wants to bless and serve our community. Lord, we ask that you would take what we give today and what we send in through through the various vehicles. Lord, that you would take every dollar that comes in and multiply it and use it to advance your kingdom. Advance it to help us to connect our community to Christ. Use it, Lord, just to to be a blessing to those in need in this difficult time. We give you praise for this in Jesus' name. Amen.
God of creation, there at the start before the beginning of time. With no point of reference, you spoke to the dark and fleshed out the wonder of life. And as you speak, a hundred billion galaxies were born in the vapor. star, a signal fire of grace. If creation sings your praises, so will I. God of your promise, you don't speak in
And as you speak A hundred billion failures disappear Where you lost your life so I can find I can see your heart a billion different ways Every precious one, a child you died to save If you gladly chose to surrender your soul I would again a hundred billion times the hand. Let me save you. Let me come to your heart. Let me come to your household. Let me change your life. God has a plan for you, and it includes this close fellowship with him, and then this close fellowship of us, of him. Just as Pastor Megan said, Jesus was teaching the disciples, even in the last moments, to follow. So will I is the message of fellowship that I hope that we'll hear even in the message this morning. I've got to tell you, I miss you. In my mind, the youth group is sitting to my right. I have some amen corners that I, I know where those people are. I've got some smilers, some encouragers, some people who nod their head as I'm speaking. And I just want you to know I'm picturing all of you right now to help me. I have you in my heart. And I know one day, sooner rather than later, we will be back together again. But for now, we just give each other a virtual hug online. Group hug, everybody. Group hug. I'm continuing my series called When Jesus Speaks. Wow, what a crazy time we're in. I, I don't know how you're doing with this. I don't know who may be loving this time at home. I, I want to know what have been some of your favorite pastimes during this time of social distancing. Uh, share them with us. Go ahead and comment and let us know how you're passing the time. We've done some home projects, and it feels good to see some things accomplished on the home front for sure. I, I know that I've just done a lot of eating. Going to go ahead, going to go ahead, just confess it, tell you I've been eating a lot. I don't know if anybody else uh, can confess the same. Um, I have also enjoyed some humorous posts on social media. You know, even though what we're going through is not funny, there have still been real reasons to smile, and um, our family has been in a competition with the Bohm family uh, daily, and we've been posting pictures on Facebook, and that's brought us a lot of joy, and I think has brought joy to some other people. I, I know that I've done a lot more praying than I have ever done, and so that's a good thing. You know, I'm going to look forward to reading your comments about how you're passing the time when this service finishes. Well, we're looking at some pretty intense passages, some red letter passages, the ones that detail the words of Jesus in this series. And the story we're going to dive into this morning is from John's Gospel, chapter 12. And it's the text that immediately follows the Palm Sunday triumphal entry into Jerusalem, where Jesus is praised and worshipped as king. Scholars that I read 
uh, after say it is still Sunday. It's still Palm Sunday when this passage opens. So hear the word of the Lord from John chapter 12, verse 20. And stay with me for these several verses, okay? Now there were some Greeks. Everybody say Greeks. Thank you. Among those who went up to worship at the feast. Very interesting. Some Greeks have come to the party. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with the request. Here's the request. Sir, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip, in turn, told Jesus. And Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. The man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me. And here we are, fellowship. Here we are. The Lord was putting this service together. Must follow me. And where I am, my servant also will be. My father will honor the one who serves me. Now my heart is troubled. And what shall I say? In other words, what shall I say to my heavenly father? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Instead, I'm going to say, Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. And the crowd that was there and heard it said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. And Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now is the time for the prince of this world to be driven out. But I, when I'm lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. And the crowd spoke up. We have heard from the law that the Christ will remain forever. So how can you say the son of man must be lifted up? Who is this son of man? Then Jesus told them, you're going to have the light just a little while longer. Walk while you have the light before darkness overtakes you. The man who walks in the dark does not know where he is going. Put your trust in the light while you have it so that you may become sons of light. When he had finished speaking, Jesus left and hid himself from them. What a rich passage of scripture. Take a moment now. Let's get ready. Let's be serious. And in a moment of silent prayer, would you ask God to speak directly to your heart and mind through this word? Would you pray? Amen. I'm not sure that I have ever really spent significant time in this particular passage except for verse 32 where Jesus says, if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to myself. And of course, these references of losing your life for Christ's sake are not new to me, but I've probably gone to other gospels to preach those ideas. So it was really fun for me to delve into the richness of this text. It's interesting to me that the passage begins with two Greeks, two non-Jews, two Gentiles coming, asking to see Jesus. Now, why is that significant? Well, I think it speaks again to the worldwide inclusive nature of Jesus' mission. Can I remind you that when Jesus was born, magi from the east, non-Jews, Gentiles, came asking to see Jesus, right, when he was born. Well, here we are now at the end of his earthly life, and non-Jews are coming again, asking to see Jesus. And John captures this nuance for a reason. Jesus' birth was announced to the world, and here in Jesus' response to the Greeks' desire to meet with him, his death is announced in a universal way as well. Jesus is like, they want to see me? Oh, they're going to see me all right. In fact, everyone's going to see me because I'm going to be lifted up from the earth, verse 32, and I'm going to draw all men unto myself. I find it interesting as well that God the Father 
speaks out loud in this passage. You'll remember that when Jesus was beginning his earthly ministry and he was baptized by his cousin, John the Baptist, God the Father spoke from heaven about being well pleased with Jesus. And here, once again, near his death, God the Father spoke. This only happened three times in the New Testament. So you know it's got to be important. God the Father was making a statement that here it was go time. Now, here's the first thing that I see about what we can learn when Jesus speaks from this text. I would say to you that when Jesus speaks, the weight of the cross is made known. Everybody say weight. Weight. The weight of the cross is made known. I want to explore with you how the glory of God is tied to the weight of the cross. Look again at verse 23. Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Now skip to verse 27. Now my heart is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason that I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. What do we make of the fact that Jesus will be glorified and the name of God will be glorified. Well, first of all, notice that Jesus did not say that the time had come for the Son of Man to be crucified. He said that the hour had come for the Son of Man to be glorified, and yet we know what is ahead for Jesus. The cross is a-coming. Somehow, listen, somehow the glory of God is tied to the crucifixion. The glory of God is connected to the cross. Now, first century Jews who heard this talk about the glory of God, they would have had a foundation in their memory. They had some experience with the glory of God. Jews knew the story in Exodus 33 where their former leader Moses requested to see God's glory. And what was God's response? He basically said, I could show you my glory, but it would kill you, right? He told Moses that he would allow his glory to pass by Moses, but Moses was only going to be able to get a rear view of the glory of God. The Jewish people knew that the glory of God was no small thing, for no one could look at the glory of God and live. Hold on to that. It was a very weighty, serious matter. It was too much to take in all at once. A Jewish person may also have gone in their mind to Psalm 19 and 1, which says the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. You can actually translate the word glory to mean weightiness. What we see in creation speaks to the magnitude, the weightiness of the glory of God. There's beauty and design in creation. It's awe-inspiring. It speaks to the power of God and to the creative nature of God and to his loving care, right? When Jesus speaks about the Son of Man being glorified, the weight of God's glory takes on new meaning. Jesus and God both speak in this passage in John 12, and what they are both saying is that if you want to see Jesus, if you want to see God in all of his glory, look at the cross. If you want to see the full expression of the righteousness of God, look at the cross. If you want to see the weight, the heftiness of the love of God, look at the cross. If you want to see the magnitude of the mercy of God, look at the cross. If you want to see the absolute display of the holiness of God, look at the cross. If you are interested in gazing at the power of God, look at the cross. Golgotha was the place where the glory of God was never more radiant. 
the righteousness, the holiness, the love, the mercy, and the power of God make up the glory of God, friends. I have never heard anyone else put it this way, but this is what God told me this week. And there, where Jesus looked disgusting, where he was marred beyond recognition, where he was repulsive, there we behold the glory of God. Isn't that stunning? It's quite a paradox. It's so surprising. It's shocking. It's totally unconventional. It's almost beyond our earthly comprehension. But here it is. The glory of God is on display on Calvary's hill. We're told in Hebrews 1.3 that Jesus is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. The glory of God, sustaining all things by his powerful word. Well, where was Jesus most radiant? Where were his words most powerful? It was no doubt the cross. You see, the cross is the culmination of every preceding holy action, every issued pronouncement of forgiveness, every extension of mercy, every word of compassion. Never were more powerful words spoken than the words Jesus spoke from the cross with his words. Jesus forgave the thief who was crucified next to him. With his words, Jesus forgave those who had tormented him. With his words, Jesus pronounced, it is finished. And atonement for sin was complete. Glory, glory, glory. Oh, when Jesus said, Father, glorify your name, he was basically saying, let's roll. Let's put the glory of God on display for everyone to see it. Jesus knew the cross would be the big reveal, the full reveal of the glory of God. Remember that show, Extreme Home Makeover? I don't even know if it's still on, but the family would come back and they'd finally see their newly remodeled home and, and you would see this big bus in front of the home to obscure their view and one of the people would yell, move that bus. And when the bus would roll away, they're gasping and they're stunning. Uh, they're, they're stunned at the picture that's behind it. Can you see it, church? When you finally see the glory of God on display, when the veil is taken from your eyes, it is like God the Father saying, move that bus, tear down that curtain in the temple, remove every obstacle so that all can make their way to me, allow the full weight of my glory to be high and lifted up for everyone to see. Wow. Part of the glory of God is the perfect way that he met his own requirements. God takes sin seriously. And sin demands a price. Sin violates God's law. And somebody had to pay. It was supposed to be us. God could not be glorious if he didn't uphold his own standard. Do you understand? He couldn't be glorious if he dismisses justice and tosses it aside as trivial. How could he ignore his own law? Here's the truth. If God didn't judge evil, he would be unjust. God can never be unjust. So what did he do? He threw the full weight of support for us. People he loves beyond comprehension. He threw his full weight, all his glory, onto a cruel cross so that judgment would be rendered to him and we would go free. That, my friends, is the glory of God. Isn't that awesome? Praise the Lord on the cross. We see the full weight of the glory of God. Oh, thank you, Jesus, for those words that you've shared. The second thing that I would tell you that I understand when Jesus speaks from John, this passage is that when Jesus speaks, the way of the cross is made known. Would you say way? Weight and way. Well, what I mean by that is that Jesus tells us that all who should be their followers, 
the followers of Jesus, all who want to follow, must come by way of the cross. He says in John 12, 24, I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. The man who loves his life will bury it, will lose it. While the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, my servant also will be. My father will honor the one who serves me. So here Jesus is using an agricultural image to help us understand what it truly means to follow him. The cross was not just where our victory was won. But the cross is also symbolic of God's will for every disciple, every Christ follower. Jesus says that when a seed goes into the ground, it bursts out of the ground with more life than it went into the ground with. Are you following me? Some people, like the Greeks, I don't know what their intention was. I can't, I I don't know what their hearts were were filled with at the time they they asked to see Jesus. But I will say some people just want to see Jesus. They just want to see what he can do for them. They just want to see what he's about. And some people never move past seeing. You see, the cross invites us to move from seeing to following. Jesus says, the way to follow me is to die. He willingly laid down his life. He was like a seed going into the ground which produced something much greater than the seed could have produced if it had not been buried. Jesus is saying he can do the same thing with your life and mine if we will lay them down. In a sense, we can be buried with Christ. We can be raised to produce greater things than we ever could if we refuse to bury our own wills. Seeing Jesus won't produce anything, but following him will produce a supernatural harvest. Do you want to follow him or do you want to just see him? By following him, going the way he went, means going the way of death to self. That's not a very popular idea. I found myself at a Walmart this week. We needed something. Outside of the store, there had been yellow caution tape placed in front of this pop machine. To keep people from going up and pressing all of the buttons and spreading a bunch of germs. That could have been a quick way for the virus to spread. And while I was walking into Walmart, I saw a man just limbo under the caution tape. And put his money in the pop machine and retrieve his beverage. Because nobody was going to tell him he could not have a soda from the Walmart pop machine if he wanted one. Death to our desires. Death to our way is something that we not only resist, but it's something we obviously will even go out of our way to defy. That's not the way Jesus took. He knew that he was facing something traumatic, something emotionally traumatizing, physically grueling, and he knew it would cost him his life. Life would never be the same for Jesus. And yet he said, not my will, but the will of my father's be done. That's the way of the cross. When we have a decision to make about who we're going to serve, and we choose to serve God over self, then we've gone the way of the cross. When we have a decision to make about serving others or preserving our own comfort, and we choose to serve others, then we've gone the way of the cross. When we forgive those who do us wrong, we have gone the way of of the cross. The way of the cross comes with the sacrifice of our wills, our wishes, and our wants. Jesus said, if you want to experience the power of production and harvest in your life, if you want to see what can be harvested when you choose to die, to self follow me to the cross. The person who chooses the way of the cross will regularly ask, God, what do you want from me? When we control our lives, We will produce what's in our power to produce. But when we allow God to control our lives, he will produce what his power can produce. Which do you want to see happen? Do you understand that Jesus accomplished far more with his death than he ever did 
with his life. And Jesus' life was pretty impressive. I mean, incredible miracles were recorded. Countless more miracles were, were done that were never written down. The following that he had, the insight that he communicated with, his teaching, it was phenomenal. He was prophetic, he was prolific, he was powerful. He impacted so many people. But it wasn't until he died. It wasn't until he willingly sacrificed his life that the exponentially powerful miracle for the entire world, not just those living at the time, but those who had looked forward to the Messiah's coming and those who have been born since his death, that's when that miracle of salvation took place. As impressive as his life was, his death brought about even greater things. And the same can be true for those who are willing to die with Christ and give God full control. Just as a seed has to be buried in order to fulfill its potential, so too must we die with Christ. Verse 27 tells us we have two options when it comes to prayer. We can pray, save me, or we can pray, use me. That's what Jesus had to wrestle with. Save me or use me. Jesus prayed the latter. And when Jesus prayed, Father, glorify your name, he was praying, Father, plant me. Father, bury me so that a harvest of righteousness can be reaped. Glory to God. Oh, yeah, when Jesus speaks, we see the way of the cross. It's fellowship. It's discipleship. It's an invitation to die. Well, finally, this passage tells us that when Jesus speaks, the works of the cross are made known. Everybody say works, works, amen. Wait, way, works. Now, when Jesus went to the cross, he went to work. Do you know that? He was working. When he was high and lifted up, he was working. Look at verses 31 and 32. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. But I, when I'm lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to myself. There are two monumental works listed here. First, Jesus says, I'm going to deal with the devil. Hallelujah. In the Garden of Eden, back when Adam and Eve sinned, judgment was passed on Satan. It was said in Genesis 3.15 that Satan would strike Jesus' heel and Jesus would crush his head. Well, that happened at the cross. What was prophesied was enacted at the cross when Jesus went to work. What Satan, you see, had to use against us was our sin, the guilt, the condemnation, the shame that come to us, that tie us up, that keep us bound, that which kept us separated from the power of God and the presence of God and the favor of God. That was all done away with at the cross when Jesus was working. Jesus triumphed on the cross. Satan, listen to me. Satan no longer has any legal claim to a child of God. Hallelujah. Even though Satan still has limited authority to slither around and roam around and bark around, he has no legal right to the church, to the bride of Christ, to those who have gone the way of the cross because Jesus went to work. And because Jesus was working on the cross, the devil is defeated in our lives. Not only did Jesus go to work to deal with the devil on the cross, but he also says, I've gone to work to draw all humanity to myself. Now, who wouldn't want to be drawn to a Savior who leads by serving, who loves without condition, who forgives to the uttermost no matter what you've done? The cross is the reminder, you see, that God loves the entire world. And that's why I preach the cross. That is why I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is why the blood of the lamb is not something that we're going to gloss over. The most beautiful thing about the cross is the salvation that was purchased for all who will make their way there. Do you understand that all of time points to the cross? All of scripture points to the cross. Jesus is the Lamb of God slain from before the foundation of the earth. 
The cross is not merely a trinket. It is not merely a treasure. It is the place of transformation where you can bury your past and take on the new life of Jesus. Oh, I love the old Gaither song that puts it this way. "'Twas a life filled with aimless desperation. Without hope walked the shell of a man. Then a hand with a nail print stretched downward. Just one touch and a new life began. And the old rugged cross made the difference. In a life bound for heartache and defeat, I will praise him forever and ever for the cross made the difference for me. And what Jesus has done on the cross can never be undone. Wow, what a work. The Bible calls it the finished work of Jesus. So that's it. When Jesus speaks, the weight of the cross is made known. When Jesus speaks, the way of the cross is made known. When Jesus speaks, the works of the cross are made known. Are you listening? Have you been transformed by the weight, the way, and the works of the cross? Would you pray with me? Lord, there was a limit to what Moses could see. That glory was too much. But God, you've made a way for us to see you in all of your glory now. When we look at the cross, we see it all. The tender compassion, the patient, loving way, the forgiveness that knows no limitation, the power of God on display as the earth would even shake and darkness would fall and the, the veil in the temple would be rent in two. Oh God, the cross is beautiful. It is our hope. It is our example. It is our invitation. And I pray that if anyone is watching today who has not settled things at the cross, that when they come to Jesus, they would come to the cross. And they would just say in the quietness of their heart, Dear Jesus, I lay my life down at the foot of your cross. Would you please give me the new life that you've promised me? Would you deposit your glory inside of me that others could see the glory of God begin to stream out through my life as I'm transformed? Forgive me of my sin. I want you to be my Savior. Hosanna, God saves. Save me. But save me to use me. God, I'm so glad that Jesus prayed, glorify thy name. He didn't pray, save me. But he gave his life for us. Help us to be cross people. Cross carrying Christians. People who daily surrender to the will of God because we want the harvest that can be produced when the power of God is at work in our lives. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. We're going to sing a song about the cross to finish our time together. And I invite you to sing this. Part of these lyrics come from Psalm 139 about how God knows us. And just know he does. He knows you intimately. He sees you. And he's just inviting you to draw closer. And of all weeks, this is the week to get to the cross. This is the week to just take in the passion of Jesus. This is the week to marvel at the love of God. Let's close as we go to the
on the cross, he takes away the sin of the world. He reveals the glory of God. Amen. We see you, Jesus. We see you high and lifted up. We see you exalted. We see you ruling and reigning. We see you. We see you in all of your splendor, in all of your glory, for you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. There is none like you. Wow. The presence of God is here. The weight of the glory of God has descended. We just take a moment not to rush past it. May we walk in the way of the cross. I want to thank you so much for joining us and thank you so much for the prayers that you are praying for our community, our world, our president, all of our leaders who are making decisions. If this is your first time to view Taze Valley Church of God service and hopefully to have participated, would you just go ahead and comment? I'm a first timer. Uh, we would just like to welcome you. Thank you so much for joining us. And if you prayed that prayer to go the way of the cross and become a Christ follower, to become a Christian, and you would like to share that with us, just send us a private message through our church Facebook page. And if you'll share an address, we'll send you a booklet free of charge that will help you get started in your new life with Christ. I want to share some other announcements with you. We will not be meeting this Wednesday, Holy Week. It is our tradition to take Wednesday night off because we will have a Monday, Thursday service. I'm not sure if Pastor Jed will be speaking yet or not. It will be dependent on his health. But there will be a Monday, Thursday service at 7 o'clock. And on Friday, we are having our Tenebrae musical dramatic service Friday night at 7. Saturday from 9 to 5, we are having an egg hunt. Not here on site, but you can drive through the neighborhoods of Beechwood, Oakwood, Hidden Valley, and Maplewood, and you can look for eggs that will be hanging in the windows of people's homes. Maybe there'll be some on a tree or a lawnmower. It might be some cleverly disguised locations, but you snap pictures of those eggs, and then you upload your three favorite to the church Facebook page with the hashtag TVCOG virtual egg hunt, and it is rumored that there will be a special guest who will be a part, somehow waving at folks who pass by. So your, your children will not want to miss out on this activity. And it's so great to tell you that we have so many community friends who aren't even a part of our church, who are now a part of our egg hunt, meeting this need for some joy in our community. Well, thank you again for joining us, and we hope to see you online Thursday night at 7 until then, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. We love you, and Jesus does too. Happy Palm Sunday. See you.